Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, we're here for our conversation. I'm calling it a conversation, not a podcast, because okay. this is sort of our normal business. We just talk and people are seeing our, you know, how we think about things. It's just the regular day here at the FDA. <laughs> regular day. <laughs> yeah, today's been a really big day, though. The two of you have actually published a new vaccine framework, COVID-19 framework, in the New England Journal of Medicine. I was actually just reading it today. Oh, Congratulations, you two. A lot this going is on big, today. Yeah. Big day. Let me hang on to that. My mom's going to put it on the refrigerator when a, I get home. Yeah, yeah. You have to frame it for her and send it over. <laughs> I mean, I got a haircut. I mean, well, a my lot. boss did oh, tell me uh, yeah, in no he's... uncertain terms. Where's Albert Einstein? I don't see him anymore. <laughs> it's a little, a little peer pressure, but uh, when your boss says, <laughs> Uh, talking about your hair cutting. Nice. Kind of yes, yeah, yeah, so it's been a big day, and you just finished kind of a big live stream explaining the framework. So I thought we could really go dig into breaking it down and, and answering some questions that I've been thinking about, and I'm sure others have been thinking about, if that's Great. okay. So we're talking COVID vaccine boosters yes. and the framework for regulation for future approvals. Yeah. So let's start with basics, where I'm thinking about my grandma at home who doesn't really understand this, right, but she knows what, about COVID 19 boosters. What is the difference between a vaccine and a drug? I think it's important just level set on kind of definitions. You mentioned this earlier in your talk, right? A vaccine is different from a drug. Well, I, I always say that uh, vaccines and drugs should be treated similarly in the sense that when given to the right person at the right time, they both can have benefit, but you know, not every drug is perfect and not every vaccine is perfect. But a vaccine basically is, a, um, is something that creates an immunologic response in the person. So you can either fight off a virus, not acquire a virus, do better if you were to get the virus. And there's even a category of vaccines called cancer therapeutic vaccines, where you fight off the cancer you've got uh, if you have a cancer and get one of those vaccines. So, you know, sort of a broad category, but basically means the immune system is doing some work in the body and we are training the immune system based on a product we're administering, typically an injection. Are you hopeful about cancer vaccines in general? Are you hoping something good comes out in that space? Every oncologist, you know, our first mantra is hopeful. I mean, we are always hopeful. And in the last, you know, 15 years I've been an oncologist, there have been so many revolutions in cancer medicine. Yeah. So I continue to be excited. I, you know, I can't discuss specific products, but actually one came to mind. There are a number good of Good line, by the way. That's yeah. a good <laughs> that's, that's good. That's, yeah. that's a good. <laughs> yeah, I can't discuss specific products. Yeah. Um, but there are a number of cancer therapeutic vaccines in the pipeline um, that have preliminary data that's promising. Um, and more broadly, immunotherapy has been a, sort of a, a major uh, boon in the cancer space. You know, I think one of the coolest thing, uh, things about this type of work is th the pipeline. What you see that is potential, that is, pr you know, pr looks promising, that might provide hope. I mean, I think there are a number of conditions we as doctors treat where we just assume these are incurable, they, they, they are, they're terminal, there's just nothing we can do. and you really get excited about coming to work here and learning about what's in the pipeline. But anyway, cancer vaccine, so that's interesting to get your perspective. We've come a long way from the first vaccine, that is the cowpox uh, virus right. that gave cross immunity protection to smallpox. to smallpox in the late 1700s, Dr. Jenner, brought it to the US. Dr. Um, I'm trying to remember his name, a phys Harvard physician proposed this to President John Adams at the time. Wow. Nothing came out of it. I don't know what happened. Maybe he didn't get the communication. Maybe he received it and rejected it. I don't want to slander him. I'm sure <laughs> he's nice. Was a nice guy. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, Thomas Jefferson ended up implementing the national vaccination program, and so vaccines have done a lot of amazing things in the United States. And Not so much. Yeah. The anthrax vaccine, that was a total disaster. Not the swine flu vaccine, that was a disaster. Not um, the rotavirus, uh, early first version of that, that was pulled from the market. For intussusception. Yeah. Intussusception, that's right. It was and then there have been some HIV vaccines that uh, have actually increased the transmission of HIV, wow. not decreased it. Good. And uh, malaria vaccine has been the holy grail, you know, a, a, a malaria vaccine. A number of people have been working in that space for 20, 30 years, and that's been a fraught space. But your point's well taken. Vaccines can be miraculous when done well. And also, there have been missteps in the history of medicine. Do vaccines prevent illness? Yeah, so I would say that many of the vaccines the public thinks about are vaccines that when given to people, they don't acquire the illness, or when given to enough people, they don't acquire the illness. For instance, if you get a hep B vaccine, you're not gonna get hep B. If enough people in a population get the measles vaccine, you're not gonna see spread of measles. The COVID-19 vaccine was always uh, hoped for you know, that it would stop the spread of COVID-19. 
but unfortunately it didn't. You know, everyone who's received a COVID-19 vaccine and everyone who didn't has eventually been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, the virus, and gotten COVID. So COVID-19 vaccines don't prevent you from getting the virus, but what they do did do very clearly in the first quarter of 2021 and in the trials in 2020 was that if you were to get it, you're much less likely to get severe disease, hospitalization, um, and those endpoints were, you know, more important. But there's a broader question, which is you get a huge benefit from the first dose and you may get some additional benefit from the second dose, but how many doses do you need before you sort of hit the plateau of the benefit you're going to get? Your B and T cells being sort of optimized to prevent severe illness. Um, because that's really what we're, everyone's concerned about, right? Severe, Severe illness. illness. So with the uh, HPV vaccine, it's recommended to get two before age 15 and three after age 15. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the number of doses thought to be required to get that sort of optimized B and T cell protection against severe illness or, or against severe uh, infection changes with age, which kind of is in line with the new vaccine framework for the COVID-19 boosters that you've laid out. So that's a really good segue to the COVID-19 uh, booster framework. But before we get into that, <laughs> did I say that oh, wrong? Yeah. No, it's right. This is the big moment we've been waiting for. Yeah, so roll. before we get into what what you're proposing with yeah, the framework, yeah. I think it's important to understand like what is the current state uh, when it comes to the, the booster? The COVID-19 vaccine yes. boosters. I think the current state is that we have entered you know, almost unwittingly, a paradigm where every individual above six months and older is recommended every year to get an annual COVID-19 shot. For life. So if they live to age 80, that's 80 shots. In Maybe 84 lifetime. shots because the wow. first few, do yeah, it's like 83 shots. Yeah, I mean, it's it seems uh, to many people uh, a big open question, you know, um, should a seven-year-old get seven shots, an eight-year-old get eight shots? You know, what is the right number yeah. of shots to get the maximum benefit for severe disease, uh, but also not to overdo something. Um, and so our regulatory framework that we have outlined in the New England Journal paper really ba strikes a balance. You know, for folks who are at high risk of severe outcomes, those over the age of 65, and those with at least one risk factor for severe disease, we are going to expedite the approval of products based on immunogenicity, which basically means Prove to me that you get antibodies against the virus and we're gonna make those products available to those high risk groups. But for people at low risk, healthy people, we're gonna ask the companies to do what we often ask, which is generate evidence in a clinical trial that these additional doses have a benefit for people. And the specific age group we've suggested and agreed upon with some of these companies is 50 to 64, a place where if you look across the globe, there's a lot of differences of opinion. Some countries go down to 45 and some go to 65. 65 and up there tends to be consensus, but 50 to 64, you know, there's differences of opinion. So we're gonna go into that difference of opinion space, a kind of place we call equipoise, where we genuinely are uncertain and generate some relevant data for the American people. And the doctors who quite frankly, don't know what to They're do. They're hungry for data. Hungry I mean, look, data. if somebody comes to you 52 years old yeah. and perfectly healthy, yeah. and they're asking you, should I get my fifth or sixth COVID booster? I mean, I have not, I, I don't have any evidence to inform an educated, strong recommendation. It's and been so a guessing game. It's been a guessing game. And to clarify game. to what you said earlier, right, that fifth or sixth, seventh, eighth, you know, 80 shots, that is different than what we have for other vaccines like HPV, where it's two or three, right? Where we kind of believe we've optimized the right. T-cell cellular. So we're an unity. outlier in how we're currently doing this. We're an international outlier. Now, I'm sure based on your announcement today and the, the lecture that you gave and live, live streamed, the media is going to call you a contrarian. I'm going to predict it. I'm going to yeah, predict yeah, it. Contrarian, their favorite word. Yeah. Um, but as you point out, the United States is the contrarian. Yes. I mean, Norway and Sweden and the United Kingdom and Austria and Germany, they uh, don't have this one size fits all policy. They don't go after young people, healthy young people, year after year, extol them to get a shot without evidence that that shot has benefit. They target elderly high risk, and now we're falling in line. And not just recommended, I mean, mandates and colleges, I mean, so uh, that's what one piece that you pulled for this New England Journal paper out today that I just love, the vaccine recommendation for the COVID booster by country. in other countries by country. In Australia, you have to be over 65 and high risk. And can, okay. we, can we clarify how we're defining high risk? Well, we're going to go by a... Uh, 
a fairly well accepted standard, which is the Centers for Disease Control have a list of high risk conditions. It's detailed in our article. It is a living document. They do update that list. Um, and uh, it's a broad document. I mean, it's a broad set of conditions, including obesity, physical inactivity, depression, uh, and pretty much any condition that makes someone immunocompromised is included in that list. How about Albert Einstein hair? Is that a risk factor? <laughs> that risk factor has been, has been mitigated. Okay, United Kingdom, you have to be 75 years of age and high risk to have a COVID booster recommended to you. France, 80 years old and high risk. I mean, the United States is the country and we are the international outliers. Yeah. And that's a really good point. And I think when, you know, those of us who have, I ran a laboratory, we had an international group of people. I've got people from Switzerland, from France, and from the UK in my lab working with me. They look at our COVID policy and they think, boy, what's wrong with the Americans? Why are you so far outside the accepted mainstream consensus? Medical all dogma. Medical dogma. Well, I, okay, we have to back up. I don't understand. So this agency, what, you know, reviewed evidence to put out this recommendation yeah. and approve things in the past. What, how did they get it wrong? If every other country well, is following well. one set of evidence, what, are, what were we looking at? I guess I'd say one thing is, um, you know, the circumstances have changed over time. I mean, you know, I don't want to uh, play Monday morning quarterback and say who got things right or wrong, but the circumstances have substantively changed. Most Americans have had COVID, not just once or twice, but perhaps many times. Sometimes they may not even know how many they've had it. Our hospitals are no longer overflowing with patients with severe disease. The rates of severe disease are down. And just as the population severity of the virus has changed, so too should our regulatory framework change to accommodate that. Now, of course, there have always been philosophical differences between Americans and Europeans, and those will continue, and there's small differences around the edges. But broadly, we're basically bringing our policy up to speed with what we're dealing with right now. So in that group, the high-risk group, yeah. um, where you're saying that um, you're envisioning a framework for approval without a pre-existing randomized controlled trial on that particular new vaccine. You are uh, suggesting that you still want to see data, but it can be done in the post-marketing commitment. Absolutely. And that's the kind of flexibility we often have at the FDA. We make things available early, particularly for life-threatening conditions, but we also fact check on the back end, make sure we're getting what we thought. And so our framework is both. You're over 65 high risk, you're gonna get an early access through immunologic endpoints, and then hopefully the companies uh, complete the agreed upon, and I fully expect that they will complete the agreed upon post-marketing commitments, and they generate that randomized evidence, and that evidence will be informative into the future. The other thing people may ask is they say, well, you know, by the time you get the evidence, it'll already be out of date because the virus keeps changing. But the simple fact is the virus is not changing like influenza changes. It's changing our internal, our, some of our data suggests 24 fold slower than influenza and the WHO is still endorsing in this season JN1 or vaccines that target JN1 which they also endorsed a year ago. So this is not influenza. This is a vac this is a virus that spreads in the summertime in air conditioned environments. This is a virus where you can generate data and we have an obligation at FDA to only approve products where we believe with confidence that the benefits outweigh the harms. And I think we can say that for high risk people for older people but for low risk people, we need additional evidence to be able to say that with confidence. Because it's been four or five years since we've had a randomized trial. There's much more population immunity now. Much more. And so um, you don't, it sounds like you don't envision uh, needs for a randomized control trial each year. But am I, am I understanding correctly? I think, you know, this may not even be uh, a shot that's a yearly shot. Maybe it should be. It should, it should be a shot offered when the virus changes, when the antigen of the virus substantively changes. A shift. A shift. And that's different from the flu vaccine. The flu, you know, flu is a, is a virus with lots of reassortment. Oh, it's it's, 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 it's <laughs> true, it's a shifty virus. It's, it's very it's, shifty. It's shifting all the time. And in fact, in some ways so quickly that sometimes our flu vaccines um, uh, don't exactly match the strains that end up circulating. It's, it's always a bit of a guessing game, but COVID-19, We'll let the virus tell us how often we need to reassess our strategy, see its mutation rate, see where we are in 18 months. And maybe this isn't a every 12 month shot, but maybe in every 18 month or every three years or every, I don't know the answer. I'll let biology dictate that, not my opinion. Bigfoot has seen very leaky polymerases in the <laughs> influenza. Bigfoot here? Oh, there he is. There he is. People were asking me if he's a real guy. Look at this guy, man. Awesome. <laughs> Good to see you, Bigfoot. And uh, Benai and, and Sangela here have been excited to see you. So, this, you know, thanks for popping in.
He's an extraordinary AV tech. Yeah. So I know uh, we don't have too much time left, but... Um, well, that's because the boss wants me to go do some things. <laughs> no, okay. The boss told me you're a big... You're busy. He gave me a big to-do list today, and so I got to go, do, do these things. First thing on the to-do list is get a haircut. Check. <laughs> Develop a new vaccine framework. Check. And now I got to pick up his dry cleaning, so I got to get out of here. <laughs> but I think, you know, one thing when we talk about vaccines, you know, there's this kind of question about what does the FDA do versus what does CDC do? And I think it's important just to kind of clarify what our role in this is. Yeah, so um, we look at the evidence and uh, issue um, licenses or what's generally known as an approval based on claims that match existing evidence. And so that's generally the role of the FDA as a regulator. And then the CDC has a recommendation schedule that's independent of the FDA. So that's a little bit how, you know, we're different from the CDC in the sense that we're not recommending or not recommending we're looking at evidence and applications and so i think you know this is a bit of a turning point in the sense that we are not going to be rubber stamping every single vaccine booster that comes here to the fda uh, without a clinical trial or clinical uh, evidence uh, or citing evidence from four or five years ago and so um, i think people want to know what the data shows. 85% yeah. of healthcare workers said no to the last COVID booster. That says something. That says, that says something. either they're hungry for some updated evidence, it's been too long, or they have concerns. Yeah, and I think that most doctors I know will be responsive to the evidence. If it shows overwhelming benefit of these products in 50 to 64, they're gonna go out there and endorse it with passion because they'll have evidence to guide those conversations. If those studies are in fact null or negative and they don't, it doesn't have much benefit, then I think it'll make us rethink what we're doing here. And we'll have to perhaps think about other ways to generate evidence. So I think- So just to make sure I'm tracking yeah. that. So to date, there really has not been strong evidence of studies conducted on those healthy populations to, to show if there is a benefit. Besides the initial studies. I mean, I don't want to take away from, the initial studies in my mind were well done studies, randomized control trials launched in 2020 that showed reduction in symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 as well as uh, trends toward improved severe disease for both Pfizer and Moderna, and uh, uh, those were the and, and Johnson and Johnson at the time, um, and and we had evidence early on that was robust. But then we slipped into this this paradigm where booster after booster, dose three and four and five and six, and the evidence for these subsequent doses was always more and more ambiguous and uncertain. Some people point to what they call observational studies, where they say, well, look, let's go look in the population, look at people who got six versus five doses, see who did better. But we all know the people who choose to get six and the people who don't, they're different groups of people. And so we have this bias there, which is the type of person who seeks that extra dose. And only the studies that we propose get around that bias. Well, Vinay, thank you for um, bringing us closer to the international community on how they approach vaccines. Um, so that's great. Uh, Sanjul, any other? No, I mean, I, I, I think this is a great step in the merging common sense and gold standard science together. So I'm really excited to see where this goes. And we I'm would excited. talk for another hour. I know. Except <laughs> you've got you've to go. give a lecture right now. I do. <laughs> I, I, think everyone, I do. But the yeah. public should certainly check out this, this paper because I, I think it's really helpful in, in understanding the framework. Yeah. And, and Thanks for the opportunity, that. Commissioner, and thank you for yeah. putting this conversation together. Great hair. Great to see you. Great job. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Thank you, sir. <laughs>